Greetings, children of God, and welcome back to the Preacher's Corner. I'm Pastor Jay, and today is going to be a beautiful day going through Luke chapter number 6 and looking at a couple of Sabbath events and ultimately reaching down to when Jesus would call his 12 apostles. Of course, he already has four of them following him, and he just received Levi last week, so he's got five for the other four he must call. So it's really exciting to see how he builds the very foundation of what will become the pillars of his church, as recognized in Ephesians chapter number four. And so what a thrill it will be as we come to the scriptures that we may be able to rejoice in the things that Jesus is doing and the teachings that Jesus is giving, so that our souls can be fulfilled, that they can be just filled up with joy in, in receiving the Lord and His Word today. So, As we get into this, we just want to go into prayer, and there are several things we want to pray for. Uh, first thing, we want to lift up Mike Walker. We want to lift up his family. We want to pray for his aunt. His aunt is in the hospital, and things are becoming more critical by the day, and we just want to ask God's hand be upon her, that that God would pour out His His love to her. And if it be His will, we, we always want to stay within the confines of the will of God, understanding even in the midst of struggle and, and pain that, that the greatest healing any of us could ever receive would be the healing of, of being with God in heaven. But if it be well with the Lord that we could have this this time together uh, on earth and that God would bless her with an amazing healing, that would be awesome. And so we want to lift her up unto the Lord. We also want to lift Jeff Suggs, same thing. We want to lift Jeff up to the Lord. And if it be well with the Lord, that he would bring forth a great healing and I pray that God would just touch him, just touch his flesh. Not not like Job, though that is possible. Well, yesterday I was talking about be careful when you ask God to touch you because, well, God touched Job <laughs> and the sufferings that he went through for the time that he had to deal with that, that Satan just buffering him through his friends and then afflicting his flesh with those legions that would grow up everywhere and 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 the pain un, unspeakable but God took care of it all at the end and Job lived on and was doubly blessed from what he was because he was a man who did not curse God he loved God and hated evil and so it was it was very important to realize but we want God's hand to be upon Jeff we went we pray that God will richly strengthen him and bless him in every conceivable way. That, that if it be well with the Lord, that he does something amazing, that a miracle happens, which is entirely possible. We hear about Joanne Brinkley's testimony and that the doctors still don't have any idea what in the world is going on because they knew that she had this. Well, another miracle would be awesome for Jeff and for his family. And so we just pray for that. And we thank God for the multitudes that we have heard about who around us have contracted COVID but have gotten well, that have gotten better. We thank the Lord for for that blessing and ask that God will just continue to, to bless, continue to heal uh, this nation, continue to to heal us. So let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your blessing. We do thank you, Lord, for every, everything you've done. We ask you, Father, for your hand to be upon Jeff and upon Mike Walker's aunt. Lord, there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of anguish. There's a lot of struggle. And though we understand that is part of this life, we don't like it at all. <laughs> and Lord, you teach us through it, but it's still a, a pain unbearable at points. If it would be well with you, Lord, 
we would commit these lives into your hands that you may bless them with a healing. A healing, Father, on this side of heaven. Lord, just if it be thy will. But these diseases, Father, indeed we rebuke. Hateful things that come from a, a cursed world and in corruption. Hateful hateful things that that have no place truly in the children of God outside of the fact that we are trapped in these vessels of corruption until the day that you deliver us. And indeed, we understand that. But Father, for the work of the kingdom and for the, for the hope of, of being able to serve you in a new and living way, we pray that you will deliver these souls in this time. Nevertheless, Lord, just as Jesus we cry out before his crucifixion, not our will, but thy will be done. And Father, this is exactly where we lay it, at your feet, and trust in you. As you say, cast every care upon me, for I care for you. That's exactly what we're doing. Father, we pray that you will watch over the multitudes in our community that may still be suffering through illness like COVID. Lord, as you have already shown us a vast multitude of victories that you have given to the lives of those who have been tested positive for this thing, and they've gotten past it, Lord, and we give you praise for that. It's something we would have never dreamed possible even four months ago, but it's happening in droves, Lord, as we see it with our own eyes. And what we see is not the same thing as what all of the reports are saying. Because we see it, Lord. We know that it's possible that we're being lied to. So we thank you for bringing this light to us out of the darkness of the, the shroud of confusion that the world would place upon us. And pray that you will continue to give us wisdom, that you will continue to give us sight, that we may continue to be able to see these beautiful victories. And thank you, Lord, for every single one of them. For we understand, Father, that it is indeed you that brings us these victories. And Father, we pray that you will watch over Ryan as he's down uh, serving you. In, in a new location for a time and, and just pray that you'll watch over my buddy and that you will give him strength in every way to be a beautiful witness for thee and that Novak up home would would be taking care of business and watching over mama and, and Cole, young man Cole will be there with him just, just blessing them we'll give you thanks and praise for what you do Lord how you do it and for the reason why you do it, in Jesus' name, amen. The reason why. It, it's beautiful. The reason why God does what he does is simply because he loves you and me. And sometimes love doesn't make much sense because it comes at the end of a paddle. <laughs> sometimes love... Uh, it doesn't feel really good when somebody's rebuking you because you, you're doing something wrong or they're chastising you. But that's the whole point of love. Love doesn't allow for evil to continue. Love doesn't allow for wickedness to carry on. Lo love puts an end to it or strives to put an end to it by, by pointing it out and by calling it out and by, by working it out. So, needless to say, that's exactly what Jesus is doing and what God has done through Jesus as we get to Luke chapter number 6. And something I want to point out, if you look at Luke chapter 6 and verse 1, the first five words that you'll see written is, and it came to pass. And if you look down at Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 6, so from verse 1 to verse 6, you'll see it says, and it came to pass. And if you look at verse number 12, you'll see it says, and it came to pass. So Luke is kind of pointing out in his style of writing a, a transitional phrase that he will often use to show you the, the disconnect between events. How much time exists, we don't know. But the events of, of 1 through 5 
are different from the events of 6 to 11 are different from the events of 12 and following. So it's really exciting when you pick up on these nuances of the writing style of, of a particular author that you can really uh, begin to understand exactly what they're pointing out to you. Because remember, Luke, he's a detailed man. He, he Being a physician, he's, he's very oriented to pointing out details. Specific periods of time, not so much, but details about about events that happened in specific periods of time very much. And so, uh, really thrilling moment to, to catch that. And you'll find that that when you look at Matthew, who, who writes as the position of a king, whereas Luke would write as the position of the man, when, when you look at Matthew's writings, it's more oriented to the periods of time, the, the specific moments of time, and the events that are in them. And then you look at Mark, and that is the the, the gospel of the servant. And, and Mark is just sporadic. <laughs> I mean, he's a, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. Well, that's, you know, much the way a servant would see things. Well, I had to do this. Well, I had to do that. Well, I had to do this. Well, when you look at Luke, you would assume that a doctor would be much more detailed about the the particular anatomy or or difficulty of a person that's going through. So you do see that in Luke. He's much more detailed about an event, but not necessarily about the period of time the event happens. And then, of course, with John, who recognizes Messiahship of the Lord, you would know that he is very much dedicated solely on Jesus, and then the events that happen around Jesus as he responds to them. So it's really exciting when you learn about the different nuances of of how these four authors kind of brought Jesus into your heart, revealing Jesus to you. And so you get to, and by the way, that's one of my transitional phrases, and so... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Just pointing that one out. When you hear me say, and so, we're, we're going to another point. Or closing down a point. It came to pass, as it comes into verse number one, it came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first. <laughs> that always cracks me up. Obviously, it's going to be a second Sabbath that's going to precede a or follow after, rather, of first, right? Which Sabbaths are these? The, the point is, is it really doesn't matter. The people who are reading this at the time that it would have been penned as concerning Luke is in his writing, they would have understood exactly what he was saying. But which Sabbath? Who cares? It's a Sabbath, and that's the point. That's why he's cool about his details came to pass on the second Sabbath after the first, that he went through the cornfields. Now we're dealing with Jesus, that he went through the cornfields. And his disciples plucked ears of corn and did eat, rubbing them in their hands. Now, some folks immediately might catch on to this, especially after the details that I was sharing about fasting not too long ago and talking about the dangers of carbohydrates and sugars and foods like that in the body. And then say, but the disciples ate corn, and you say that corn is one of the worst possible grains that you could possibly eat because of the high concentration of sugars as carbohydrates it would be in corn. Well, that's true, the high concentration of carbs, but also corn, no matter how you cut it, is genetically modified today, so it's it's not a safe food to eat because it's very genetics. Its DNA has been manipulated and tampered with to alter it for so many different climates and so many different places, and gene splicing destroys any potential nutrients it could have had. The corn that these guys are eating back in Jesus' day have not been tampered with at all, so they are a natural source food, and it's guaranteed that Jesus' disciples have a regular life, a regular lifestyle of fasting. They, they might eat once a day. They, they might not eat for two days. So the opportunity and availability of food coming in, regardless of what that food is, is going to turn out being beneficial for them, for the body to be able to store more fats from the amount of fats that they burn off 
as they go through their days when they don't get a chance to eat. So this is actually really good for them. And if our diet was the same as their diet, we would be okay with this too. But it's not the case. Our diet is so much more affluent and rich in foods that are processed and foods that are high sugar that, yeah, this was just add to us, not take away from us. Needless to say, these boys are out there in the field and they're plucking corn. But when, when are they plucking corn? Oh, look, they're plucking corn on the Sabbath day. Now, the Pharisees are going to go to work. Remember, we've already been dealing since chapter 5 with the Pharisees and the scribes that accusing that accused Jesus of sitting with you know publicans and sinners and and all of these horrible things accusing his disciples and about fasting you know uh, what's wrong with you people you're not doing anything you're supposed to according to what the law says and to top it off cherry on top of the sunday it, it comes to this point where jesus with his disciples are on a sabbath day and they're out there in that field and they're picking some food to eat. Of course, one of the rules about Sabbath day is that you were supposed to take a double portion on the day that preceded it so that on the Sabbath day you would do no work. Now, Jesus walking through the field of plucking corn on a Sabbath day to the Pharisees and scribes is considered work. Therefore, Jesus is guilty of violating Mosaic law. And so you'll find in verse number two that certain of the Pharisees spoke out and he said unto them, Why do you that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? So why do you guys do why are you guys doing something that is not lawful to do on the Sabbath days? And and Jesus answered them, Now <laughs> arguing with God never gets you anywhere but lost, okay? You're not going to win against God. And Jesus, God, he's Yeshua. He's the very salvation that God would give to the world. And it, it, he is God incarnate. So we, we see this point that Jesus, after he's accused of this, he looks at them. And I love what he has to say. Jesus, he comes at them and he says, have you not read so much as this? <laughs> What David did when himself was hungry and, and they which were with him, how he went into the house of God and did take and eat the showbread and gave also to them that were with him, which is not lawful to eat, but for the priest alone. <laughs> now, they come to him and they say, how dare you do this work of, of eating these this corn, of picking this corn and then eating it. It's a Sabbath day. You're in violation of the law. Jesus said, now, uh, I know you guys are very familiar with Mosaic law, and I know you guys are very familiar with the Torah entirely, but you're also familiar with the Kings and the Chronicles and Samuel, and you're familiar with, with the Scripture. <laughs> He says, didn't you read somewhere in, the, in that where David, remember the king, the, the one whom we are all looking to come back, right, and, and establish a throne? You remember David, like the guy that everybody worships is thinking he was the greatest thing since sliced bread? Uh, David, when, when he was hungry, he walked up into the holy place. Now, where David was going was a place where only the priest could go. None of the Levites, none of the, the people, none of the men who were in the outer court, or the inner court, I should say, or the women, course, in the outer court, but none of the men of the inner court, none of the, nobody but the priest was allowed inside that holy place. And then, of course, the high priest for the Holy of Holies. And so David, this is an, a really neat connection between David as being the king and the priest, which is recognized in Jesus as the high priest and the king of kings, is that David strolled up into the holy place and just grabbed the table of showbread and started munching. Now that, that bread was to be the bread for the priest per the day for them to be able to eat, 
but David and his men just walked up in there and started munching. Now, that wasn't lawful to do, so to speak. But God didn't strike David. Not, not even close. I loved it. And Jesus is like, what's the difference? If you want to accuse me of something, fine. But I'm doing exactly what David did. So to accuse me is to accuse David. Are you brave enough to do that before the people? <laughs> you go, Jesus. I love it. And, it's, and so he said this very powerful point, and it, and it just stands to this day. He said unto them in verse number five, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. You see, David was Lord of the, of the holy place, and the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath day. If the Son of Man chooses he's going to eat corn on that day, praise God, he eats corn on that day because the Son of Man is Lord. You see, the Sabbath day is not Lord over the Son of Man, in which case the day itself would crush him for breaking the day's rules because the day would have some kind of power or authority over man. You see, the, the, the scribes and Pharisees claimed that the day carried a power of its own to discipline a people who would be in violation of what the law said, but the reality was it wasn't the day at all. It was the Pharisees and the scribes that would hold such power in their own hands to be judges over the people as gods deciding that the ways in which they would have been guilty of violating this Sabbath day thereby themselves being lords over this day, ensuring that the people would stay under their footstool uh, by the requirements that they would press against them by the law. Whereas Jesus, being recognized as Lord of lords, as Jesus would find that this day would be a day sacred and holy unto God, but that in this moment being unhungered, that he would not be in violation if he chose to eat, for he is the one who established the rules to begin with, that as he chose to eat, he ate, and there's no violation of himself, no violation of his people. Therefore, the day has no authority over the Lord, but that the Lord would carry the authority over the day. Very important for us to understand. And so, even though you would find that, that, that Jesus ate during this period of time and then he was in the fields, uh, you know, in the fields doing so, that the people would accuse him that he would stand his ground and this would be the case. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Yes. So you'll see a transition to another period of time with another event that's going to take place on another Sabbath. First, they come after him because he was eating on the Sabbath day. Second, they're going to come at him because he's healing on the Sabbath day. Well, what the, what's the deal? I love Jesus' response on this particular situation. Verse number six, it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. And the scribes and the Pharisees watched him, and rather he would heal on the Sabbath days. <laughs> I love this. Nobody's paying attention to what Jesus is teaching. Everybody knows this guy with a withered hand is in there. Everybody sees Jesus coming in. And now it doesn't matter. It, Jesus could have taught the, the, the coolest message that ever existed on the face of the planet, which he usually did. No one was listening. No one was paying attention. The only thing that they cared about was if he was going to break the law again, if he was going to heal that guy on the Sabbath day. Nobody cared about what was being said or taught. And that... That's sad because you have a great amount of people who will show up in church on a Sunday and, and the you know that, that great amount of people, they're not there to hear God's word. They're there to sing songs. They're there to listen to music. They're there to, 
to see the plays and, and, and do the programs, but they're not there to actually soak in and receive God's word. They're just there to play. And the same with these scribes and Pharisees. They, they're there because they've got to show themselves religious. They're there because they've got to show the community their position. They're there because they, they want to be worshipped of men and seen of men and, and, and sought after of men. They're, they're not there because they're actually looking for God. They're there because they're showing themselves to be gods. <laughs> and so... Jesus comes in and, and he begins to teach, but this guy with the withered hand and everybody's in there going, what's going to happen here? Now, I remember uh, once, I, one time when I was in Guatemala, I was in a village that I can't remember the name of, but I'm pretty sure I've got pictures of it somewhere. I'll have to remember the name of it. But being in this village, uh, we we were visiting with the with the people and and as we came together we were gonna we were gonna have a a prayer together and we we intermingled with the people to my right I had a man who was standing beside me who had a withered hand and and we were kind of off to the edge so that he was a person that probably was not very well received by the people because of the malady and what have you. It's like, ah, Ichabod. But he had a withered hand. And, and I remember looking over at him and and he just kind of kind of shrugged to the side and, and I just reached down and I grabbed his hand, kind of his, his wrist area anyway, and I grabbed his hand and I smiled at him and we got into prayer and, and when we got done praying, I mean, that... that it was a life-changing event. I had no idea. He, he just whipped around. He's probably about 75. Anyway, he just whipped around and gave me the biggest hug I think I'd ever received in, in country. And I got a lot of them. <laughs> and it it was just a smile. It's it, Wow. I mean, it's it still to this day, it baffles my soul that something so simple as a sweet gesture of of recognizing this malady, but saying, you know what? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change who you are. And I'm I'm perfectly happy and, and, and glad to hold that appendage because it's a part of you. And I want to hold you, even if it's just this. I want to hold it. I want to hold you. That's exactly what Jesus does to us. He wants to hold us. And it doesn't matter what our condition is. He touched the man with leprosy. He, he, he done, he's already done so much. He heals the blind. He, he takes whatever sicknesses a people has and he, he eliminates it as we see him do so in Scripture. He raises the dead to life so he can hold them. So he can be with them. That's Jesus' desire. And, and the outcome turns out to be something that, that changes lives. <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be too bad for the children of God, it wouldn't be too bad for Christians to realize that, that it doesn't take much to transform the world. It, it really doesn't. It takes the love of God coming out of you. That's really all it does. Now, that love may come in a position of rebuke where you might have to correct somebody whose who's thinking is, is incorrect or, or who's, who's being mean or rude or hateful. You might, have to, you might have to get a little bit serious on it. There's still love. Jesus did the same thing with the scribes and Pharisees. So you might have to love them by, by rebuking them and chastising them. You might... You might need to love them just by wrapping your arms around them and tell them that 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 it's okay. That that you know God is still in the miracle business of forgiving everything, anything. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, where you've been, or where you may currently be. It doesn't matter. It's exactly where God's going to meet you. It's exactly where God's going to forgive you and exactly where God's going to begin to mold and change you into his image from Satan's. That's where he's going to find you. 
And so it's very important for us as the children of God to recognize that we are called to be His love to a world that's never known love at all, who's been swallowed up by the, the hatred and the wickedness of that old devil as he thought that he would be in charge, recognized by, by Satan taking Jesus up on the, you know, the mountain and taking him up on the top of the synagogue or the temple and taking these kingdoms I possess and I'm willing to give to you. Well, the whole world is spun in confusion and lo is lost in sin. And the whole world is suffering in that valley of the shadow of death being swallowed up in darkness. And, and we're the light of it. We're called to be the light of it. Jesus said, you're salt that preserves and you're light that shines. We're, we're the light of it. And so it's necessary for us to realize that, that as being the very presence of the love of God, we need to just get out there wherever we are and be the love of God. It takes courage. It takes heart. But we can be if we would choose to be. Now, here we are. Here's this guy, withered hand. Here's these scribes and Pharisees. They're watching Jesus, not listening to him. They're watching Jesus, whether he's going to heal on the Sabbath day. Look at this. That they might find an accusation against him. Why in the world are you going to bring up an accusation about a good work, a good deed? Uh, I mean, something that is good for him to do, right for him to do, and you're just looking for a reason to kill him already. <clears throat> they had a problem, though. Jesus knew their thoughts. <laughs> you see that in verse number eight. It says that he knew their thoughts and said to the man which, was, which had the withered hand, Rise up and stand forth in the midst. Oh, Jesus is putting on a, a demonstration at this point. He's making an explanation and teaching a whole crowd of people who aren't paying attention to his teachings to begin with anyway. So if you're not going to listen to me and you're, you're so infatuated with watching me, then I'll take what I'm teaching and I'll do it in front of you so that you can see the reality by watching of what I'm saying. Oh, Jesus is good at this. And so, <laughs> there's my transition again. He, he, he knew their thoughts, and he, he said to that man, Rise up, stand forth in the midst. So the guy did exactly what he was told to do. And in verse number 9, it's, Jesus told him, I will ask you one thing. Now, he's talking to the crowd of the, of the Pharisees and the scribes at this point. He says, I will ask you one thing. The question, Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil. Now, <clears throat> they're going to have to obviously come to a, a conclusion about this. Sabbath day is the day of the Lord. It's a day where we study the Lord, where we pray to the Lord, where we, where we soak our souls up in the Word of God. So is it, is it lawful and good, or is it lawful to do good or to do evil? Well, it's a no-brainer, but it's, a very powerful question. Obviously, it would be lawful to do good. Evil would not be uh, something very smart to do on a day where you're supposed to be worshiping the almighty good and righteous God, right? So, to do evil is out. It is lawful to do good. Then Jesus goes forth and says, to save life or destroy it. Again, uh, you cannot have anyone die on the Sabbath day as you are killing them, right? Like the death penalty that, that God actually is written in his law. So it's, it's something that is, that is governed by God because of the evil that does exist inside of man's heart and the willingness of man to be evil, even on the days where he's at least supposed to be good, that there, there is that death penalty and and so the people of Israel, like Jesus, having to come off the cross before it crossed over into a Sabbath day because it would not be lawful for them 
to crucify someone on a Sabbath day. It would not be lawful for them to have someone still lingering in life on that cross and dying at the point of the Sabbath day. And so like the thieves on the cross beside Jesus, they'd break their hip structures and shatter their leg bones and just drop them off the cross to lay there and die. So it wouldn't be their hand that killed them. It would just be, you know, happenstance that they died. Imagine the thoughts behind that. It's kind of evil, isn't it? So you have this situation where Jesus really has a bottleneck. First, you know it's it's right to do good on the Sabbath day. And of course, on the Sabbath day, saving a life would be most precious, whereas destroying a life would be against the law. And so Jesus snares them right there. They cannot catch him. They cannot kill him. Because as he heals this man before them, and by the way, did you get the teaching? Do right and save lives. Because if you do evil, you're going to destroy lives. So do good, (laughs) because if God lives in you, you have the ability to do good. Do good in order to save lives. Stop being evil, thereby destroying lives. Jesus' teaching is that simple. And he's using this man to prove it. He has this withered hand, and though he be among the people, no one would have much interaction with him because, as we saw in Job's friends yesterday on Sunday, we saw that that they accused him in two fronts. One, all of his wealth was taken away by God because in some form or fashion, he had sinned against God, so God is destroying him. So, number two, his illness is a direct result of the wickedness that is in his heart. And if he would just confess the right thing, if he would just just repent, then God would heal him and he would get back all of his wealth. So, the belief was is that this man with a withered hand is recognized with the paralytic, is recognized with the, the blind man of John chapter number nine, who did sin, this man or his parents, it would be recognized this man with a withered hand had somehow offended God or his his mom and dad, his parents would have somehow offended God that that he would be born this way and that he, that he would not be able to work uh, effectively with both hands. Therefore, he would be considered unclean. And though he's in this room, he's really not a part of it because nobody respects him. Nobody cares about him. Nobody pays attention to him. He is a bastard of the devil even. He's a bastard of the devil because in his birth, he was born with this withered hand, which means that he was born a sinner because somebody had to sin. He either sinned in the womb or his parents sinned a grievous sin that he was that he was cursed by it. And, and so he's, he's Ichabod, man. We don't have nothing to do with him. Anathema to him. You know, he's, he's done. And he's the very example that Jesus is going to use. <laughs> and so Jesus asks, is it, is it right to do good? Is it right to save lives? Yes, yes. Is it good to do evil? No. Is it good to destroy lives? No. There's your lesson. Go forth from the rest of this day. Be good. And don't do any evil. <laughs> And looking round about them all, Jesus said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And and the man did so. And he restored it as whole as the other. And they were filled. Why? They were filled with madness and communed with one another what they might do to Jesus. He just did something great. He just saved this man's life. He wasn't doing anything evil, which would be of Satan, and he wasn't destroying anything, which would be of the devil. He did everything that God would do, and they hated him for it. Apparently, they'd rather see the devil in him, but there is none, which is why they hated him all the more. We'll catch up to this tomorrow at the 12 Apostles appointment and and much more, so God bless you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful. We ask that thou would watch over us and that thou would give us an opportunity to finish the rest of this day very well in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen.
God bless you, keep you, and cause his face to shine upon you. And I'll catch you tomorrow at 4 o'clock. God bless you guys.